and then suddenly URL get was also a stupid name because it wasn't get anymore. You could even you could do it both ways. Yeah. So then I had to rename the t the tool again. So then I renamed it to curl in, in early 1998. Here we go. Inside security episode number 17. This is actually the first episode that I'm not live streaming on Twitch. So unfortunately, we won't have the amazing Twitch chat um, interacting with uh, interesting questions. But I do think we will still have a really interesting episode coming up. So the guest of today is the creator of something that you're almost guaranteed to interact with or use on a daily basis without even thinking about it. Uh, and it's so cool to have you here, the creator of Curl. Welcome, Daniel Stienberg. So good. It's so good to have you here. I've been wanting to have you on for quite some time. So I finally asked them and then you said yes, which is awesome. So I figured just to sort of set the, the ground and the baseline straight. Um, so I think that a lot of people actually don't really know what Curl is, or perhaps they only use Curl to just fetch data from a URL and that's it. So being the creator of curl if you had to describe it in like one or two sentences what would that be and then also sort of touch upon in which devices is curl typically being used in family members fully understand what it is and what i do but so, yeah, I so but i but i try to sort of when i start with it of course i work with software engineering stuff you know i'm a software blah blah so i write code and people usually have some idea of the, about that. And then I go into, well, so curl is a command line tool, libcurl is that library. And it's an, it, I, I usually try to call it as an internet transfer engine component module, something that does internet transfers for others. So it's usually that something wants to do internet transfers. And of course, t typically you don't know why would you want internet transfers for? So people don't actually understand that you're, you know, your car actually has to download maps to get the maps to your car, or your your fridge can't show the recipe on this on the you know on the door without getting that. So people haven't really thought about that. But I'm trying to then to say that curl is that little engine that helps the other applications to to do that internet transfer, send data or get data. And that is what curl tries to be focused on that particular thing internet transfers using one of those protocols it supports spe specified as a url actually that's what that's part of the name right c url um, so that that is how i try to phrase it it's uh, typically people don't really understand anyway so <laughs> sort of yeah, yeah. It, <laughs> there's something with internet and software yeah exactly <laughs> i heard internet <laughs> <laughs> exactly so, yeah I, i've used internet so, yeah i know so internet. can you help me with my printer no but, so, <laughs> Uh, okay, yeah. so but then of course, so libcurl is that library that we've, we've been working on for quite a while. I actually I think we released the first the curl we, we shipped curl under the name curl in in, in spring 1998, and we uh, sort of remodeled it and made a library in in the in the summer of 2000. So it's been uh, well a little over 21 years we have had this library, and since we've shipped the library, it's been adopted and, and uh, deployed in lots of places i mentioned cars so <clears throat> pretty much all all brands of modern cars have curl in them you know it's so curl is now in all servers it's shipped by default in windows in macs in all linux servers it's used by a lot of uh, apps in, in phones it's used in in phone operating systems it's basically used in all operating systems you can imagine or or even ios android chrome os and, and uh, yeah, everything. And um, more and more in all sorts of devices like watches and uh, TVs, streaming devices. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's literally all everywhere. It, all over the place. There's actually very few internet connected devices then that don't have curl in them. So we estimate that there's somewhere around 10 billion installations of curl worldwide or well, give or take, it's really hard to estimate, but in, in that vicinity, so it's an insane amount of curl everywhere. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> that's everywhere. So imagine like playing with the idea that um, curl just sort of broke, like the internet would break, right? Yeah, that would be <laughs> really bad, <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that might be sort of a way to sort of understand it um, 
quite good as well, I think. If curl broke, like everything would just break. Yes, I, but, I but, unfortu but, but fortunately, it is, it is usually used in, in constrained use cases in many different places. So usually, even if it would break in one particular device, it's not necessarily that it's going to break in another device using it for a slightly different purpose. Mm. So, so at least it's, they're usually, I should call it, you know, separated installs, sometimes separated builds, separated versions, separated. So yeah. I would say that the risk that they all would break at some point, at, yeah. you know, in unison, that wouldn't, that won't happen. Of course, it can break anyway. Yeah. So a, a question I, I rarely get to ask someone who's, who's a creator or something, how many planets has Curl been used on? <laughs> two. Two, so far, right? <laughs> Number of planets, two, yes, exactly, <laughs> two so far. That's uh, pretty but, cool. and, and I actually don't know about the moon, but I, that's not a planet either. So, yeah. But I've, I've, I, I know for a fact that it's been confirmed that they've used it on the helicopter Mars landing project so i know it's been used on mars and on earth so yes it's a pretty cool achievement actually that, that, that's really cool. <laughs> and that, that's something that quite few people get to say right yes yes exactly <laughs> so okay so you created curl well you started with it in 98 right but how did you get into computers at all to start with well i i'm an old guy i started long before that so i, I got into commodore 64 in the 80s so i uh, at the first well, the, one of those early waves of home, home computers, and I've sort of got stuck with it immediately, sort of fascinated by that. You know, you can control the computer to do what you want if you just learn how to. So I, I was fascinated by programming and, and the, doing things pretty much from the beginning. And then it sort of stuck with me and I got into spending a lot of my spare time hours on, on programming early on and then it just been like that since then <laughs> never stopped that's that's really cool so do you think it sort of um it touches on your sort of creative uh, mind or is it just to actually create something or, or yes it is an act of creating something and and sort of um, yeah it's a little bit like building with lego when you were a kid pretty, pretty yeah. much. you have all the pieces you can make it whatever you want as long as you just put your mind into it and, and making sure you sort of stick to it and make sure that it happens. So I think it's it's that part, at least part of it is that sort of creativity to make make something. And then also w w it's, it's the next level then so that when you've created something that actually see that someone else appreciates it as well. And they sort of tell you, maybe you should do it this way too and do that. And you get that sort of uh, loop and they, yeah, well, the positive circle sort of. So they say something, you know, get more users, and that sort of inspires you to keep on going. Yeah, I can imagine that. So the the feedback is also very important, the positive feedback, because if nobody ever would use it, nobody ever would like it, then maybe I would have grown bored and just, you know, I'll do something else instead. Yeah, that has to be one of the most positive things, doing open source projects, right? Yes, yes, it certainly is. And so And that sort of helps keep keep the motivation up and actually motivates me to keep going and keep fixing things keep adding things so how, how did you how did you create curl from scratch or like what was the background to it like why why even start making something like this? well i i um i had i worked on another project at the time in actually back in 1996 i where i wrote an irc bot together with some friends so we had a bot that's the early Fnet days on IRC. I and then, then we had, uh, yeah, there were actually pretty uh, wild and crazy days on IRC. Uh, a lot of attack bots and a lot of takeovers <laughs> of channels and stuff like that. So we were actually writing a bot to help us protect our chat channels. Yeah. But anyway, so one of these days it struck me, well, wait a minute. So we were an international bunch on that IRC channel talk. I think we were, I talked a lot of uh, Amiga in those days because it was sort of in my Amiga days. Um, Anyway, so we were, you know, international crowd before the euro as well. So there were a lot of currencies. So and, and sometimes we were talking about things and, you know, the price of things and you, how much is a computer of this in your country? So you would, but, you know, currency translation. So I, it struck me, I should offer that. My bot should offer the currency translation. Yeah. Of course, how much is 100 US dollars today in Swedish crowns or vice versa or whatever yeah. currency? So uh, sure, easy peasy. I just need to get the currency rates from somewhere, you know, 
and how do you do that? Yeah, well, they were provided by, I could of course figure, that was 1996. Um, so there were sites that provided currency rates, you know, just a listing currency, this rate converted to dollars or whatever. Mm. So uh, to, to make sure that my bot could do this, I needed to download that rate, the, that list of rates, uh, maybe twice a day, once a day. Uh, so I just needed a little tool to do that HTTP download. So um, how do you do that? And back in that, um, I, I've searched. Google wasn't around. I bet it was Alta Vista. I don't actually remember <laughs> how I searched for it. So, yeah. so uh, that was years before Google came. Uh, so, uh, and I found a tool called HTTP GET. Okay. That was what it did an HTTP get. So yeah, and I got that tool and I started with that tool. That And that tool actually was released for the first time in um, November, 1996. So I sort of found it just uh, mm. weeks or days after it was released the first time. And that was written by a guy uh, from Brazil. And it was just, I think it was about 300 lines of code. Very simple, easy yeah. piece of thing. And of course, doing a single HTTP get is very easy. So, uh, and then, I got that and then it sort of did what I wanted to. I don't remember exactly what it was, but I found some bugs and I sent back a patch to the guy and we started sort of communicating. I, we ex I extended it a little bit more. I got some of my other bot friends involved and we started poking on it. And it just took, I, I think it took me a few weeks until the, the Raphael, I think his name is, first name uh, who wrote it, he said, well, maybe you can just take it over and, you know, <laughs> do what you want with it. So I became the maintainer just uh, maybe a month after I started using it. Mm. So I started developing that HTTP get tool to do more things that we wanted to do, you know, added pro support for proxy and whatever it was. All, all for that purpose of getting currency rates. So and, and while doing that, I also, so one day I realized, wow, you can get currency rates from Gopher. And I found this UN site, I believe it was, that had hundreds <laughs> of rates. Cool. I want my currency service to have hundreds of, of rates. That must be much better currency. <laughs> of course, most of those currencies, you know, were never used by any one in that chat <clears throat> channel. But anyway, yeah. sort of, you know, I could do it. So, oh, oh, Gopher, by the way, the, my, my tool didn't support Gopher. <laughs> I had to add support for Gopher. So <laughs> I did that. Gopher. Gopher is, is, is not that sort of different than HTTP 1.0 at least. So I did that. It was pretty easy. And it just took, I, I don't remember the timing here exactly, but it just took a little while until I found even more currency rates and this time on FTP. So, ah, okay, right. But then I just ha need to add FTP support as well. <laughs> F FTP being quite different than the other protocols. But yeah. anyway, <laughs> I did that. And, and after I have done that, Actually, somewhere in that, in the middle of that, I actually realized that, well, wait a minute, this tool is called HTTP get, but now it does another product, several other protocols. It's sort of nonsensical name. I need to change it. So I actually changed the name to URL get. And then <laughs> so I worked with that and then had those three protocols. And then one day someone needed FTP upload support as well. I don't remember exactly why, but mm. we added FTP upload support that in the early 1998. And then suddenly URL get was also a stupid name because it wasn't get anymore. You could even, you could do it both ways. Yeah. So then I had to rename the, the tool again. So then I renamed it to curl in, in early 1998. So then I, I shipped it as curl. I kept, I actually bounced um, the version number from before. So it actually became curl 4.0 in, in March, 1998. Okay. And then it spoke those three protocols and then it did uploads with FTP. And sort of at that point, it was about 2,000 lines of code. And uh, then it had 24 command line options. I, I know that because I've gone back and checked, actually. <laughs> <Of course>. so, <laughs> because because it's a sort of been a, such an insane journey since then. So I sort of uh, just for my own sort of pleasure, go back and see what did we actually start with? Yeah. Because we started then, well, then in, in early 1998, and we had 2,400 lines of code. That has now grown to about 170,000 lines of code in the actual products. Uh, and the number of command line options have, has then risen from 24 up to 243. So we're roughly 10 times the number of options since that uh, day in, in, in 1998. So do you, do, you, do you know all of them by heart, those command uh, those uh, No, I don't. <laughs> well, but, but I think if I, if I read it, I have a I think I know mo most uh, what they do actually and yeah. how they work. 
but I certainly couldn't remember all of them. A it's lot of them are, are, yeah, they're, they're, I mean, that's quite a few. And, yeah. and a lot of them are very niche too. So many of them you basically only use for a specific use case, right? That most users probably never even encounter. So, yeah. What's the most uh, obscure command line parameter? Like the one that's been was rarely used. Do you know? Uh, well, no, I can know it right because there's no statistics or yeah. any, we don't know what people are using. But I would imagine that there are there's stuff basically you know technologies that are running out of life. You know, mm. for example, we introduced an option for for a particular way to negotiate HTTP two in the beginning in, in 2012, I believe, mm. and that was a technology that was basically deserted after a few years. So that's called NPN. Uh, and uh, so there's an option to enable disable the use of npn but uh, basically that's totally useless today because <laughs> it's probably no yeah. service around anymore that supports it even so it's yeah it's just an option it's there we haven't removed it uh, uh pointless for most people but it's there and do you do you have remove well. options or do you just keep them all i keep them all <laughs> so yes i don't i actually don't remove yeah yeah it's, it's uh, sort of okay uh, that's actually not entirely true, but uh, <laughs> that's the story I go with. Yeah. No, so I, I actually, I, I, I do my very best to never re remove them. I should put it like that because okay. it, I actually removed one last year oh, right. uh, because of basically of security reasons. I didn't actually remove it. The option is still there, but it basically refuses to work if you use it. <laughs> okay. The equivalent. Of. So otherwise we make a really big effort to make sure that we whatever we introduce we keep supporting well indefinitely really yeah, nice. so that so that you can rely on at whatever point you upgrade curl you should know that it will continue working exactly as it did before and the same goes with libcurl so we make a, an immense effort and to make sure that it just will continue working like it did before even when you upgrade yeah so if you upgrade you you're not breaking anything no, exactly. And so you should be always be able to upgrade without any negative consequences. Yeah. Positive, good, yeah. ideally, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, going, going from there with Carol, like, was this an overnight success at some point or was it some tipping point where like usage sort of dramatically increased or has it come gradually? No, it, it's really, really gradually. Hmm. So, um, there was never any point in time when suddenly, you know, felt, wow, I, I made it. It was really, really slow and okay. only, only ever gradually growing. I have this excellent uh, fun moment when I go back and look at how I sort of posted a, a news item on, on the website in November 1998. That is, uh, well, a little bit of a half year after I, I released the curl the first time. And this says with sort of happy that we had 300 downloads during that month <laughs> and i thought I, I thought that was great you yeah. know 300 users sort of in in a single month so i i view that as a cool thing and as a good thing and so i think that sort of also shows the expectations i had in the beginning because yeah how would i know i mean how would i know what people want or, or, or are going to use so i had no idea what to expect and i didn't really anticipate it either so it just went on and on and uh, also, to be fair, uh, we, we made curl in a pretty good time. So we, of course, we had no idea where the internet was going or the, you know, the web or everything so that we would, but we created curl, I think, pretty good in a time to sort of follow the wave of websites and internet use in, in society in general. So it's sort of, we, of course, followed along. So when everything, you know, expanded and blew up, we also got more users yeah. and, and sort of got used more. Absolutely. So I have this slide in my current presentation that said in 1996, there were 250,000 websites. And today there's 2 billion. So it's actually grown by 8,000 times since 1996 when we started. So it has grown significantly more than Curl itself has. <laughs> yeah. So the, uh, yeah, the places where Curl can be used are quite more. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, indeed. Yes. Yes. And at the same time, in the other end too, I mean, that's websites. So at the same time, I mean, in, in the world today, basically everything is networked, right? So whatever we use today, even if it's not networked today, you can assume that someone is going to make that same product 
next year and it's going to be networked or you know it's going to yeah. be have a battery power and the bluetooth or wi-fi or whatever so i think we're only going in forward into uh, future with even more networking and yeah. more networking is a potential for more curl absolutely i mean the the general consensus seems to be if my product can talk it should <laughs> So. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and if it doesn't talk, we should make sure that it talks because it's going to be a sales pitch, right? Yeah, so whatever absolutely. you have, if you can make it talk, it'll be a sales pitch and then we can sell it for a little bit more money tomorrow yeah. and, and, and beat our competition. <laughs> But I mean, this, um, this increase in usage and the, of course devices and everything that can be used, it's, it has its own flip side, right? Because I've seen your Twitter posts with this sort of, and I'm doing air quotes here for the podcast, feedback you get. Some are nice, some are just insane <laughs> ramblings and stuff. Like, yeah, what's the uh, what's the most common thing you get, and what's sort of the most worst stuff you got? Yeah, okay. So, so first, just to to make to explain why that happens is because yeah. in the yeah, good. Um, the 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 curl license is a MIT license thing. We actually, for some silly reason, modified it slightly in the in the early days. So it's actually not exactly an MIT license. It's oh, sort okay. of, yeah, yeah, a few words in it that are actually modified, which makes it sort of not match MIT. So it's actually <laughs> listed often as its own license, but it's oh, okay. it's pretty much an MIT with a few words twisted. So okay, but it, it, that license little thing, just you know, 40 lines, 30 lines of uh, of you know so this English mumbo jumbo. Uh, Uh, legalese and it says copyright Daniel Stenberg my uh, email address uh, and so on and a lot of places they just copy that thing into their about window or you know open source license window or whatever it is window uh, and that usually then contains my email address there hmm. and that is pasted in everywhere so it, a lot of cars for example you can go to some you know obscure window in, on your car and see open source licenses and then if you scroll for half an hour you will get to my <laughs> email address you know they're usually yeah. insanely long and without any way to search or anything but for reasons people then find my email address in all sorts of weirdo products and i think in many cases uh, my email address is one of the few email addresses around in that product Because people, I don't think they typically have their own email addresses in those products. I don't, mm. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure, because it's it would make sense, right? Right, but, but so so there's this user. He's upset because he can't figure out how to do something in his car, and you know, he's tried every sort of of support channel that he he or she knows about, and then he scrolls around in different menus in the car, and he finds my email address. So, so he has a problem with the. I have this great uh, email somewhere when someone had a problem with his GPS. And so, yes, then he emails me and, and asks me detailed questions about how to configure the GPS in his car. Because, you know, your address is in my car. I have a problem with my car. I email you. And I have this tricky situation. What do I do with this email? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I've, I've tried to sort of email back and say, I, sorry, I don't know what you're talking about car I, i sort of and often these manufacturers that you put my code in their products they haven't told me about it right so i don't yeah. i didn't i didn't know that my code was actually in that car or in that watch or in that whatever they're asking about so for me it's usually a surprise sort of oh wait a minute you're using that kind of product and you found my uh, you're asking me what well, why are you asking me <laughs> yeah. about this i have no idea so usually it is as We're very far away apart from each other. And if I try to say, you know, I actually don't know anyone at that company. I, they, uh, I don't even know what kind of product you're talking about. They they don't really believe me. Yeah. They saw that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You are saying that. Go <laughs> ahead. Talk to your buddies now and ask them to help me out with my GPS. So, uh, yeah. so I usually actually rarely respond to those emails nowadays because i feel that the distance between yeah. me and and the user asking me questions that's just too distant so they don't believe me or they or they don't understand or and i don't yeah. understand the other so I, i get it the, sort of makes sense i mean if, if we're stepping away from being technical for a while and like if if someone wants to reach someone like they look for an, an email address and the first one they find in the product should in their sense probably like reach out to someone at that company 
or at the website yes. or something. So yeah, I, I agree. So uh, from their point of view, it's, it makes sense. Yeah. But I also think it's actually emphasized the problem is also because they probably also tried the easy solutions, right? So when they find my address, they're probably not. I'm probably yeah. not the first uh, sort of go to. So I'm probably number. <laughs> 14 and, you know they have all disappointments yeah. all the way and then here i come and they're fed up no 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 i don't know <laughs> <laughs> so they're probably you know fed up already yeah no 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 fix this for me now <laughs> you silly person in the other end <laughs> so I, I, yeah. I feel a little bit of that sometimes so that yeah yeah sort of yeah i'm i'm, I'm option number eight here so yeah, he's I upset stuff isn't working i have no idea what they're talking about <laughs> uh, uh, you know that that can Often it's just confusing for me. Often mm. they're just talking about things I have no idea. And sometimes it becomes more of a, from my point of view, more of humor because it's sort of sort of yeah, it's ironic or, or, I don't know, sad that they're actually asking yeah. me. I understand that it's not sad from their point of view, but from my point of view. Yeah. And I have this excellent uh, thing that I, it's actually a, a, a number of years ago now that a woman emailed me and asked me to fix her Instagram account. <laughs> it was one of those moments. What are you talking about? Why are you asking me about this? So, yeah. uh, and, and then he's, she says, oh, well, I had a hacker friend of mine help me and he found your address, look. And then he sent, she sent me a <laughs> screenshot of, of uh, this about window in Instagram that says curl license, yeah. blah, blah, blah. And I, all oh, right, Instagram uses curl. Cool. I had no idea. So I tried <laughs> to explain that. Well, that this is because, you know, Instagram is a company. They're using curl and it's a component in their software. And, and she basically said, yeah, 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 yeah. Fix this for me now. Yeah, Just talk with your guys, at, your friends at Instagram so they can help me uh, uh, fix my account. And I said, no, no, no. I don't know anyone there. And, you know, <laughs> and then I thought, find it back and forth a number of times. And then I thought that I finally had convinced her sort of, I don't know anyone. I haven't hacked anything. Yeah. Uh, I just write this code. And then sort of she came back again. Aha, you've been lying all this time. And then she sent me another screenshot. Look, your name is in Spotify as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 you know, it can't be a coincidence. Your name in two, my, two apps separately from each other. So certainly you had, you're the one who has actually hacked my phone. Yeah. So now go fix this or I will tell these companies that you're a hacker and you don't want that. <laughs> Yeah, because you were in a hacking ring, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so she threatened to tell uh, <laughs> Facebook and and uh, Spotify that uh, I run this hacking ring. So that at that point, I pretty much gave up. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like you actually gave it a good try, anyway. So uh, can... in that case, I actually did. I, I yeah. did a real, real effort to to sort for of nothing claim that I'm innocent in this. <laughs> yeah, all for <laughs> nothing in the end. Yes. Yeah, and then of course I uh, have. Uh, I mean, it goes from that confused to amusing things, and and usually they're they're in the, the, that sort of category of just mm. amusing, confusing thing, and then of course I got this uh, set of death threats uh, like a year ago or so from another also deeply confused person who found my email address in some sort of connection to what he claims was an uh, an attack or a hack of his systems and he blamed me for having he having lost his home and work and family and everything and then it turned out very dark and, and uh, ugly uh, immediately and, you, and wrote, you wrote a blog post about this right yeah uh, yes i did but it sort of hit me pretty hard Ex exactly at that moment anyway when he sort of he wrote that in an email and and i didn't take it seriously first because i said what are we talking about mm -hmm. and then he actually replied to my email sort of immediately and insisted that uh, he was sincere and he was going to make it reality uh, which which sort of just uh, confirmed that he, he wasn't he hadn't sent, sent this by accident but then sort of the more i communicated with this uh, person it more and more so it hit me first and i got sort of concerned it was a bit sort of it came a little bit too close a little bit too hard mm -hmm. but then i communicated a little bit more and then he ended up more and more uh, appeared more and more confused and you know deranged pretty much so oh, okay so and then i think then i got a little less 
serious for me because it seemed like you know he had confused everything so it's a very strange sort of feeling for reality so then i'm more yeah he's probably you know sick or or, or he has a problem that is way beyond me somehow mm -hmm. so it made me feel a bit a uh, little bit more safe about it and that same person actually then emailed me i think about half a year later and apologized oh, okay that's Which, at least something positive from that yeah that was a sort of a positive and i think it was a, a strong of him to do that yeah um, and so I, I, it was great and it felt sort of a little bit of a relief but it also it also showed that that his sort of excuse or explanation why he had pinpointed me in that was also deeply confused and sort of really that was how you found me sort of yeah he had confused me with other persons with with, with that called daniel and yeah it was a really okay crazy explanation that i didn't really understand either so <laughs> like <laughs> I, I i i chose to not sort of focus on that but say focus on yeah he apologized he sort of he, I think he also had some sort of disorder that made him sort of, yeah, made him have difficulties to sometimes separate, you know, things from that maybe wasn't totally real from what he. <laughs> yeah, so, sounds like there could be some underlying reasons. Uh, exactly, or, exactly. Yeah. So, so yeah, but uh, still, that was an outlier. I, I actually very rarely get that kind of nastiness. I usually yeah. get that level of, you know confused emails but that's good i mean as long as the positives outweigh the, the negatives right that's, oh that's absolutely you, I, I actually usually just think that all those emails i get they're they're fun and, mm. and that help me get a sense of what people find me my address in <laughs> i mean you know I, I you know, oh really you my my product is in this product or in this device i had no idea so it helps me that and I, yeah. you know, i think it usually is just good fun do you track it some somehow somewhere like where it's being used or is it just too much it's, too it's just too much i've i used to try to track it mm. but it became far too spotty so just yeah i know oh, okay. a bunch of places but you know at the same time i don't know so many others i have this collection on my blog just when i try to collect different snapshots of curl credits and different products because that's just fun but that's you know just a little that's just for fun it's it's not, not by any means complete or, or covering of anything that's just random yeah so all right so that's uh, i mean that's the negatives of uh, the negative feedbacks or the experiences with this right what about the positive stuff like has this like has this uh, history with curl helped you in some way with like uh, job application experiences or other perks or, or something <laughs> oh absolutely yeah. so uh, so, well, more or less my entire life <laughs> is curl or yeah. has been curl or turned even more curl uh, over, over the years. So, so curl was my spare time project for a very long time. And then I pretty much got my job working for Mozilla with Firefox in 2014. It was actually pretty fun to go there and have my um, interviewing with Mozilla, pretty much sit around all day and talk about curl and HTTP client <laughs> code. Because nice. already back then, people knew about curl that I sort of I, I was the founder and maintainer of. So mm. we, nobody doubted my ability to understand or, or the protocol side or development side. So we, that was a fun sort of experience to just. So I think I, I, I was in a good position for that interview and, and get that job at Mozilla. So and then um, at Mozilla, I worked with Firefox, HTTP, and networking stack, pretty much. But I had permission to do part of my work hours and spend on curl. Not that curl was used by Firefox or Mozilla by any means, but just because for the for the goodness of it. Hmm. And then when I uh, finally, so that already then, of course, curl was a good way for me to get that job because I really wanted to get the opportunity to try to work for, for a company like Mozilla. Yeah. Uh, and that was fun, good. And and then I in twenty in late twenty eighteen I quit there and then I saw, decided to try to make something real and start working with curl full time. So then of course in, in then in early twenty nineteen I um, started working curl full time. So and I now work with this company called Wolf SSL and we sell curl support to companies basically just, so so i was just about to add how how you monetize from that so how do you actually work full-time so it's by wolf ssl yeah so so i work 
so so I get a paycheck from Wolf SSL, and and we at Wolf SSL we sell support for Curl to customers, and we have different uh, so then of levels of support and pretty much incident based or contract development or feature additions or you know bug tracking or whatever companies need help with in regards to Curl. Um, yes. Is you is built around this support. So usually companies end up buying paying for support then for for a period of time and for a number of incidents. Because that's um, I mean that's that's really interesting. Because I was thinking about um, open source products mostly be, being for free, right? Um, in almost every single case. So like, do you think that open source developers should get backed more by companies like monetarily? I mean, or is the part of being an open source developer that you don't have to rely on companies or is it on a good level as it is? Yeah, it's, it's really hard because I think there's a little bit of everything here because open, open source is such a wide concept that yeah. we have everything of what you just said uh, sort of that exists. And there are some projects that clearly should be more supported. There's also this freedom from companies that I've always experienced with Curl that we're not relying on reliant or relying on any particular you know, major company, we can do exactly as we want. And that's a freedom. But at the same time, we need someone to pay something to someone so to be able to, yeah. to run everything, you know, infrastructure and actually get features done. And so, so someone has to pay at some point. So there's a little bit of that. And at, at the same time, I mean, anyone giving away code for free as, as an open source licensed, we know that companies are in their right to just take the code and build something and run with it. Yeah. It's not that they're actually doing anything illegal because then we shouldn't release it like this. Exactly. So it's so it's a little bit of everything. But ideally, of course, we want to, I, I, I mean, I released curl open source from the beginning and I still do it because I, from the beginning, I just wanted to be, to make sure that I was also part of open source and I wanted curl to, you know, be able to get ported to different devices and get, and I wanted to get help from everyone so that it would actually improve and become what it eventually became, but because I had no sort of, um, I didn't, I never thought that I would be able to do that myself. And I still don't think yeah. that I would have been able to do that myself. So, I mean, there's been a lot of people that have helped out to make curl what it is today and, and still helps out. So I think open source is part of the explanation to what has made curl what it is and what it sort of still is. Mm -hmm. uh, so I want it to be open source, but of course I still also want to get paid. So I, I still also struggle with this um, sort of a little bit of up and downs. So what do I do? What can I do to make sure that companies pay me? But I also don't want to sacrifice curl. I want to release curl open source. So I have that duality. Um, and it's, uh, is, I think a lot of open source projects have that struggle. You yeah. want to have it open source because of all the goodness uh, that you get from open source, but you also need an, uh, food on the table and, and your family happy. So you need to make that work somehow. Yeah, so probably like like you do, sell services around your open source product, right? It's yeah, that, idea. that's certainly one way. I mean, it doesn't really scale the same way as, you, as if you would have <laughs> yeah, sold your true. software. Then I would have kind of billionaire right if you sell them <laughs> it, it one dollar per, per, per device <laughs> right exactly so it doesn't scale like that at all mm. but i don't need it to scale like that I, for me for me it's good enough if i if i'm happy and i can work with I, what i think is fun and i get a good paycheck out of it then that, that's good enough for me and mm. it seems to work and we're actually slowly growing the business so it seems to seems to do okay is, is it your business wolf ssl no, it's not. But uh, but uh, sort of, yeah. They're very. We're very good friends. It's a small oh, okay. company. So and and Wolf SSL has other uh, open source libraries that yeah, uh, yeah. we also support. So it's uh, Curl is pretty much one. Then out of a set of maybe ten different libraries that we support, they're all open source, and we sort of provide them under the same umbrella. And uh, and really, there's nothing that prevents us from if if we grow big enough, if we grow up the Curl business big enough, we might. Spend been off a separate company at some point in time that it would become just curl support okay. but right now it actually works pretty good to have uh, support and sales and everything sort of together with the other libraries because it makes it really sort of very low overhead so i basically do all the support right now because we don't have 
more business than that. So okay. it works pretty good. Yeah. So I do a portion of my day pretty much divided, uh, devoted to support. And then portion of my day, I do whatever I want. And that is usually then fixing bugs, feature development, you know, merging and reviewing code, uh, managing whatever I want to do around curl. Nice. So something that I just came to think about, because you get donations to curl, right, from various companies like AWS and such. Yes. Would you ever turn down like a massive donation? Uh, and like, because that company would then say, we're, we're, we're the main contributor to, to curl and we, we're financing like 95% of it. Or would you be okay, like fine with that? Mm, well, uh, I'm fine with sort of, I'm fine with changing the optics and saying things about companies, you know, or if someone donates a lot of money, I'm fine with calling them out for that sort of mm -hmm. and thanking them for being main sponsors or gold sponsors or whatever sponsor they want <laughs> us to say they are. Yeah. So I'm fine with that. But I would sort of, we're also in a fortunate position when it comes to curl that we're not, we're not that dependent on any donations right now with sponsors so i wouldn't oh, okay. i wouldn't i wouldn't accept anything to sort of try to control the project or yeah. or you know demand a certain certain direction or, or that we would do anything you know uh, sort of give up our soul or, or give up our policies or, or concepts for for money that we're we're far away from that yeah, we're actually nice. in a pretty good financial situation so that's no really then cool. we turn them down that's, that's really nice what um what about i i like to sort of get uh help new people get into the business into well my area is security of course but if we're talking about like programming and coding and stuff like do you have any sort of advice or tips and tricks to aspiring coders and let's let's say they're into open source like do you have any sort of lessons learned or things that you wished you knew beforehand and so uh, for for like let's say youth or or, or aspiring coders I think, um, first, I think that um, it is easy to think a lot of things about open source projects that you just observe from, from a distance. And you um, you might think that you know that they're, they're advanced or, or too complicated for you, or maybe that they have you know, raised the bar and it's too hard for me to get into. I don't know this. But all, first, I think almost every open source project out there uh, they're willing to accept contributions from anyone, right? So they're mm -hmm. all actually willing to accept uh, help and contributions. So th that's the first thing, whatever project it is. And however old or mature, I, I mean, I get the questions quite a lot about Curl. I mean, we're, we're old by now, yeah. but there are so much left to do, right? It's not that we're done. We're, you may not have found a bug recently, but you know, there, there are heaps of them. You, if you just scratch the surface, there's lots of things to fix and and that is sort of it, it's not unique for us right all yeah. projects have like that because all Absolutely. projects keep evolving so we fix bugs we add things we add new bugs and we fix bugs and it's a constant thing and it's like that everywhere so there's first that that you can be sure that everyone actually wants projects or, or help with their projects and, and then i think it's just a matter of of uh, getting to know the project a little bit and i think uh, usually you can if you're if you're new to, to open source, I think it's a good idea to maybe work on or look into a project that you maybe you use yourself or you think is fun or you look interesting. I mean, that you have a particular interest in, not yeah. just um, maybe you have a glitch you've found yourself. You're getting annoyed by this little thing that happens every time I do a web. And then maybe just hang around the project, you know, watch the code, see what happens on their issues or mailing lists or forums or whatever. Get to feel a little bit about the, um, you know, their culture. See who's doing what. What are they saying? I mean, most I would say open source projects are just uh, not that many people involved. They're all friendly usually, and they're all trying to do their best to make sure that things are are progressing forward. So usually, just by being friendly and you know open with what you want and what you are set out to do, you can go very very far. Mm. Uh, but then, of course, there are exceptions, but you can avoid the exceptions, right? If they're, they're, if they're unfriendly, uh, they, they don't seem to want you there, go somewhere else. Because, yeah. I mean, the world is drowning in open source projects. There's no, there's no lack of open source projects. And most of them will be friendly and accepting to whatever. 
that's really good. And that's that's that's, that's some good some good takeaways, I think. Yeah, I think so. I think there should be very little that sort of should stop you from from doing good open source in um, other than in mostly in your own mind, right? And yeah. and a lot of people don't think that well. I'm not good enough. I don't know enough, or or my code isn't sort of beautiful enough for me to be show it to the world like that. But that is so not true, right? So you just have to get over that feeling because we all have that feeling. Yeah. Uh, so just no, it's not like that. Just if you fix the problem, it doesn't matter if it's. I mean, if it's if the code is ugly, it's okay. But because someone will tell you, or or, or get you will get that feedback when you submit your pull request or what, however you do it, mm -hmm. and then you of course you iterate, you work on it, you improve. I mean, nobody is perfect from the beginning, and we're all beginners at start. So of course everything, and everyone is doing bad things all the time, right? So we just have to iterate and fix it again and continue. So I think yeah, get into it, dive in and and get uh, get coding. Sounds good. I, um, yeah, it, it's always a bit of a sort of imposter syndrome where you're afraid to, like, you're not going to be good enough. And if I submit this, they're going to see that I don't know what I'm doing, really. But you might be, you, you might be good, actually. Yes. Just yeah. do it. And, and I think that imposter syndrome thing, that's something that sort of plagues uh, all of us, many mm -hmm. of us, all mm -hmm. the time. We just have to sort of try well. to push through it. Yeah, I think that's a, it's a very wide phenomenon. So, so. You, you just have to sort of, I think, at some point, ignore it and, and pretend it's not there and actually just um, reach out and do it anyway. Yeah, oh, of course, it's easy for me to say because um, I'm not, maybe not there right now myself, but it's still like that, it's still true. Yeah. All right, so we reached the, uh, the part of this show which I call overrated, underrated. And this is the part where you're not prepared for anything that's coming. And I'm going to just throw out it's like three or four questions or topics or subjects. And like you tell me if you, like you individually think that they are overrated or underrated, right? And you can elaborate more or less if, if you want to, but it's, it's up to you. So one of the easy ones that are, not the easy ones, but one of the more common ones, sorry, that I like to ask is uh, certifications. Like are certs overrated or underrated? And I mean personal, personal certs, like. <laughs> Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't think <laughs> uh, if if I would be sort of a model here, I would say that I don't I don't have a single certificate for anything. Yeah. So I think I think they um, they don't have to be very useful, or I mean, you can get away or you get around without them in many cases. But I also think I, I understand why they exist. So I, I think in certain areas or for maybe for certain types of things i think they m fulfill a purpose so i'm not sure i'm not sure exactly how 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 they rated in general but uh, for me usually i i think of them as overrated yeah i am um, i like to say the same thing i also think they're overrated but i think they're useful in sort of getting past hr at various companies exactly uh, sort so. of like you, you check boxes like exactly if, at least that you need to have. a little bit like people use uh, yeah. Uh, regular education for these days. You need to have this past, otherwise we won't talk to you. Sort of, yeah. But, 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 oh, no, no, no. Sort of, sort of like yeah. that. So you almost answered the next one uh, by yourself, but this is, um, so higher education, like universities and stuff, are they overrated or underrated? Uh, no, I, I really cannot say that they're overrated. Uh, so, <laughs> so then I'll go down to underrated. Uh, so, the, even if I myself don't have any higher <laughs> education, so <laughs> again. <laughs> so what, why why uh, underrated them? Well, well, basically because I think in comparison to certificates, I think that's much it's a harder obstacle to avoid, or I mean to to work around if you don't have it. That's just why I say it. I I mean I myself don't have it because I managed I managed very well without it but i think it's harder today and harder for every uh, regular person to get where you want without a higher education so i think that's why i think that you should still go for that yeah i agree i also feel that it sort of differs where in the world you live i think certain countries has way higher expectations on your higher education than perhaps perhaps in sweden where you can get a like, get away with having experience instead that is true i think that's very true because i think in some hierarchical 
local uh, cultures, I think it's even more of a requirement mm. than in Sweden. We have sometimes a little bit more flat. So you, you can do things. If you have just a strong will and just set yourself out to do it, you can manage without it. But it's certainly harder, I think. Yeah. I, I also like to think of higher education because I don't have it either. So I'm not, I don't know what I'm, what I'm talking about here, but, <laughs> but I like to think of it as you also have that personal trait of delayed gratification. Like you can see that if I do this for three years and down the line, I will get a better job. And I think that delayed gratification is a, like a character trait for success, I think. Right. So you know that it, everything doesn't come instantly, but if I do this, if I work on this for, for a long time, I will actually get better at this. And in the end, I will actually have a better job or... Uh, meet someone or, or, or something. Uh, I think it's a really good character trait to have. Oh, it is. It is, yes. Yeah. And also, I, th I believe the higher education, like universities, teach you sort of critical thinking and presenting to uh, at least some form of group or, or, or public uh, like that as well, which I think is good. So it's not only the knowledge, I, I'd say, in, in like school and stuff. It's well, things like these. No, things exactly. Like, there, there's a lot uh, like that. And also, if we're talking about our specific sort of, if we're talking about software engineering, IT, mm -hmm. also think that it's an area that has exploded yeah. over the last 20 years. So uh, maybe when I was young, it was a much more narrow area and it's easier to get into without having that higher education now it's has become a much more wider rich universe so it's maybe it's harder for you to get into that on your own to yeah. actually get somewhere yeah i agree right next one is and i'll explain it but physical conferences as opposed to virtual conferences so are they overrated or underrated mm, a... tough that's a tough question, actually. Oh, thank I, you. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's really tough. And I think during this pandemic, we've had a, a lot of chances and opportunities to think about this because I think, without then saying over or under just yet. So, <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, pre-pandemic, we, of course, had a lot of physical, but basically online conferences never happened and it was mm. more of an illusion and uh, people will say that it couldn't be done. So during the pandemic, everything, every physical one turned into an online one because they didn't want to disappear. And then you, we could all experience how it is to have an online. It's not at all the same thing. It's much harder to attend and much sort of harder to keep focus. And, you know, you just drop out and do something yeah. else and then you forgot about the conference and then you had lunch and then you sort of never came back. And at, as a presenter, it's the same thing, right? Doing a presentation, I've done a lot of presentations. In yeah. general, I've done a lot of presentations to physical conferences, but I've also done like, I don't know, maybe 20, 25 during the pandemic. And a presentation online is even more difficult than in, in a physical. Like, it's like literally talking to a wall. Yeah, and you get no feedback, right? No feedback at all, you know. <laughs> If I would try to be funny, did even one person <laughs> sort of get that or have they all left? Has, yeah. has they all fallen asleep? Or are they all bored? You know, no feedback at all. And sort of and also it's it's harder to keep it's harder to do the same pace of presentation even to to do that in, in front of a screen as in, in front of a live audience. So I think and then, of course, all the networking that could come from a physical, you actually sort of bump into someone, you stand in a line to get your food or coffee or something. That, mm. that is, of course, completely gone it, online. They, some try to replicate it in some, you know, lame ways, <laughs> but it's really <laughs> never the same thing anyway, because yeah. sort of bumping into someone online is not the same thing as sort of actually bumping into someone. So now it's really, really hard to, to do, uh, I think, a good but then on the other hand, there's there's a lot of upsides with doing online, right? So because you don't have to go anywhere. You can just attend and it's there and drop out and you didn't lose any work hours just because you happen to attend a really lousy talk and you can just, you know, <laughs> switch to do yeah. some work instead and then switch back. And you, so, so and, and you can go everywhere across the globe and, and you can get a lot more attendees. And so yeah, there's a lot of benefits with that. Mm -hmm. But I, I can certainly feel now sort of since we've in, in, in sweden we pretty much there's not a lot of signs of the pandemic left because all the restrictions are gone yep. and boom everyone is starting to have conferences and physical meetups again and we can really feel that everyone who has been doing physical conferences who did them online now are desperate to go back to do them physically so this period of online conferences that's 
soon is going to be a past tense and sure someone is going to talk about hybrid versions because yeah sure you some some of them will allow you to attend some sessions online but it's not going to be online conferences they're going to be physical one with some online you know presence but it's going to be uh, crappier <laughs> experience to go, to do them online so i i don't know i yeah. i think i think so therefore I, I have a really hard time here to decide if, if they're underrated or, or, or overrated mm. i told you these are trick this there's not hard questions the tricky questions right? the, the, so yes I, yeah. I think this one is i think i have the hardest to answer so mm. yeah i would say that they're yeah so yeah i don't know I, uh, I, I will say that they're overrated. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because you can attend to much, well, well, many more conferences if they're virtual, right? Then. Yes. Cool. Yeah. And I, I, I have to admit that I, st I struggle now it's because, you know, immediately now I start, I'm start getting, I'm starting to get invitations to do presentations on different conferences. And I have to admit that, yeah, right. There's a conference yeah. in this city, in this country on this date. Do you want to come and say something? It's, it's traveling. You mean I have to family. travel there? Yeah. It's going to take me like three days to get there yeah, and exactly. talk for a bit. And I, uh, can I do it online? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it's a really tricky question because, yeah. I mean, most people probably say, oh, physical is better than this. And then once you start to discuss around it, you're like, well, maybe virtual is quite nice. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, there's, there's really, it's, yeah, it's really hard because there's, there's goodness and badness in, in both ways here. Cool. So we decided for, for um, overrated physical. Yeah, I had to pick one. So yeah. I, think, I think I go with overrated. Awesome. You know, I'm a working from home person. I've been working from home since 2014. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In the comfort of, of your own home. So, yeah, <laughs> exactly. I, I get it. <laughs> no pants. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's the good part about just having the <laughs> upper part of your body, right? <laughs> exactly. So we, we reached the, um, the, last, uh, the last question of the overrated, underrated, and the last question of this show, actually. And the question is if this is overrated or underrated, and it's demo parties. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I would say that they're, the, these days I would call them overrated. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, I was a part of the demo scene in, in Sweden in the sort of late 80s, early 90s, back on the Commodore 64 days. Yeah. And then I, was, uh, I, I appreciate them, that I appreciated them greatly, but it was a completely different time and era. You know, the, we didn't have internet. We didn't have networking. Even we just had you know floppy disks. <laughs> yeah, there's no need for copy parties now, right? <laughs> exactly. So, that, so, but, but I, I also think it's pre. I actually don't. I, I'm not sure. I think them, they are actually overrated. Yeah, They're yeah. sort yeah. of of a different universe than one that I'm in. So I'm more of an observer. Yeah, so I don't. Yeah. I don't really have an opinion. If if people are happy with them and they find sort of enjoyment and and they're think that is fun to do let them do it i'm sure they they will have a good time and, and that might come something good out of it mm. i i won't attend any yeah <laughs> i'm pretty sure so, so back in like early 90s and which were your favorite parties was it birdie or something else no but back in then it was, was it? more the, yeah. the we organized know? they were just more of a sort of single event oh, okay. parties I was I was part of the demo group called Horizon back then, and we did we organized a few of them, a few times there, and then I pretty much stopped doing Commodore sixty four uh, in maybe around ninety one or so. Yeah, okay. and then I I also stopped attending demo parties, or copy parties as we call them. So they they served their purpose, but back in the day, right? Yeah, exactly. So, well, more that I left that universe yeah. more than that they actually. I mean, they're still ongoing, right? Mm -hmm. Different than that back then, but still. Yeah, I think there's a time and place for everything in everyone's life, right? So it's no, absolutely, absolutely. That. We're all sort of you're, yeah. you're in one kind of world at one point in your in your life. You don't have to stick there forever. Exactly. But maybe, but maybe that little thing still sticks anyway, <laughs> even if you're not there anymore. Most likely. Right. That's actually uh, all the uh, topics and stuff that I had in mind to talk about. Did I uh, did I forget something that you want to bring up, or did we sort of touch upon? 
Uh, I think we've touched a lot of things. I don't yeah. know if I have anything else to say. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you how do you get in contact with with uh, Wolf SSL if you if you want to? Well, yeah, you go to the website, of course, and you check out the, the support deals. But you can also just Google curl support or whatever, and you will find it because it's not it's going to be easy. Or you just contact me or whatever. We're we're sort of casual and, and no bureaucracy or, or high bars to get past. So actually, you can get in contact with me, whatever it is that is related to curl, and I can sort of help you out or point you to the right place to do next step. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much for, for coming. And, uh, and it's not going to be included in the show, but sorry for the, uh, the initial technical difficulties, <laughs> which not a single listener or viewer will see, but you know of it. And yeah, <laughs> thanks for the patience. No worries at all. It was just fun. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. We'll, uh, we'll speak more another time. Right. Absolutely. Take care.